Good to be here. Amen. Good to be saved. Bless God. Good to hear a uh, old little Marshall thirteen. You know how many? You know how many people been in church forty years and don't know Alexander the Great's kingdom was divided into four generals, <laughs> right? Right. Man, it's just, that's just awesome sitting here, a thirteen-year-old boy, get up and talk about the Bible. It's rare anymore. Yeah. Hey, Amen. Uh, but it's, it is good to be here, man. Some of you I know. Some of you I met here last year. Some of you I don't know. Some of you it's the first time I've met you. But it's just, I love these things. I love traveling around, getting to meet different saints of God and fellowship with different people. Brother Daniel and his, his mother's been a blessing to us the times I've been around him. Marshall and his family. Brother Ken met him last year. Just love these things, man. And something I got to do anytime I travel outside of the state of West Virginia and preach in churches like this, I always got to put it out there that I'm not speaking in an unknown tongue. This is just how hillbillies talk. <laughs> So if y'all need an interpreter, whatever, you know, but it's just how we talk in Appalachia. But, uh, but I mean, try, try your best to keep up, right? <laughs> Revelation chapter 20 is where we're going to start. My subject is Satan, and uh, probably won't start actually getting into too much detail about Satan until tomorrow night. But as you're turning there, I just want to say, man, I, I love this book right here. I love this book, man. This book has picked me up when I've fallen, showed right. me my Savior, right. taught me about the blood of Christ, showed me justification with God, showed me my eternal purpose that I was given in Christ before the world began, yeah. showed me that I was called with a holy calling, right. showed me that I have eternal life and an eternal purpose to live in Christ, right? And then gave me the doctrine to build me up and to edify me unto godliness for the purpose of living out not only the life that now is, but that which also is to come. Amen. It showed me what's truly profitable. Godliness is profitable unto all things. If a man has godliness and food and raiment, he has more than he ever needs for this life. Right. Amen? Right. And I thank God for that. I thank God for this book, but you know, this, this book turned out to be nothing like I thought it was going to be when I actually started reading it. You hear, you hear people talking about it growing up, and you think it's a, it's a religious book, it's a, it's a book about religion and stuff like that, and then you pick it up, and you got God making some covenant with some goat herder over there in Genesis 15. <laughs> you know, a, a real estate deal. Abraham's there in a deep sleep, and God says, he, this, this is unconditional now, and because the nations don't get this, they're going to get themselves in trouble. God made an unconditional covenant with Abraham and said, Unto thee and thy seed have I given this land. You realize how important that is? Don't sound important. I mean, the news ain't going to talk about it. Right? You realize over there, over there David bought the threshing floor for morning, Right? To make sacrifice. You realize the Temple Mount, you have an historical receipt. You know how much the, 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 the price was paid, right? You have the receipt, how much money was paid, the piece of land and everything. Right. You have a, have a record in 140 some different languages of David purchasing the Temple Mount thousands of years ago. People say, well, the Bible don't really matter. Do you know what claim the, the Muslims make to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount? Because, because some, some epileptic pedophile named Muhammad had some bad dreams one night? Right? right. right? Yep. You think the UN's got enough guts to give the, to give the, the, the Temple Mount and the city to who it belongs to? And because they don't have the sense God gave a brass monkey, they're going to have to fight Jesus Christ on the battlefield over that piece of land one day. Yeah. Amen? Right. That book has gone forth there without excuse. Amen. 140 languages. Right. Been in your language for over 400 years. Longer than that if you go back to Wycliffe in 1300. Right. Been in the English language for close to 700 years. Yeah. Went worldwide into 140 different languages. The nations have been warned. And God even stuck in a 2,000 year dispensation of grace to you Gentiles so you could get out of the mess before it got here. Right. But the controversy is over a piece of real estate yeah. Oh, yeah. chosen by God 
Moses, get your shoes off. That place is holy ground. There's a conflict for that land. This, as we talk about Satan, we're going to realize that Satan in his heart has plotted out a plan and a plot to possess heaven and earth from the Most High God. Right. And that includes the piece of land that God chose for himself to dwell in. And so there is a controversy in the world we live in. We don't live in a safe world. And because the nations are ignorant of this, because the nations refuse to read this book, 13-year-old boy just got up, got more sense, got more sense than the people running the UN. I mean it. Ishmael, what did God say about him? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. You think the UN's got the nerve to do it? No. You know the price they're going to pay for not doing it? I know the price they're going to pay. Joel 3, the UN's got it up there on their foundation stone. Got Isaiah 2. You know, they shall beat their swords in the pruning hooks and their spears in the plowshares. Right up there on the United Nations foundation stone. Now you read Isaiah chapter 2. First, the, house, the, 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 the mountain of the Lord's house has to be exalted above all hills, don't it? All nations have to be going to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. United Nations skipping a few steps. Because I'll tell you what God said to the UN. He said, beat your plowshares in the spears and your pruning hooks in the swords and get down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. God is preparing a day of war with the Gentile nations. That's scary stuff. Zephaniah 3.8, you read it? Wait upon me. Till I rise up to the prey, for my determination is to gather all nations and pour upon them my fierce indignation. Isaiah 24, God said he's going to make the earth empty. You know why he's going to make it empty? Because the inhabitants of the earth have defiled the ground and have broken what? The everlasting covenant. You know what the everlasting covenant is? It's the land grant given to Abraham. Yep. Amen? Yeah. That's where we're headed. That's where the world's head in the year 2022. That's right. right? And it's gone forth to all nations in, in 140 languages. It's right here in English. And the world's too stubborn to read that book. Because of that, they're headed towards military conflict with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You read Zechariah chapter 1? Them red horses sent out? Man, that ought to send chills up your spines. You know what that is? That's, that's the angel of the Lord sending out his scouts of war into the nations to bring a report back. And they come back and say the whole earth is at rest. And it displeases the Lord. The Lord who's chosen Zion. Right? right. Man, that, that's some scary business. But that, Bible, that, Bible's a, 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 that Bible's a strange book, man. It's a strange book. It's not anything like I thought it was going to be. Look here in Revelation 20 and verse 10. You see, we're this, this uh, I'll write it over here. I want to make sure who, I mean, I, this is what the uh, conference is about. Universal salvation. Now, right off the bat, I want you to understand that we're not talking about universal reconciliation, that crowd. We're talking about people who say, that, that God is going to save every creature, right? That there is no eternal conscious torment in hell. That even Satan is going to be saved by the time it's all said and done. And, 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 and they, they come to this conclusion because they say, well, God created all, that God created Satan corrupt, basically. Right? right? And so look, look here in Revelation 20. It's, it's sad that we got to deal with stuff like this. Yeah. Because I'm getting ready to read you something that a five-year-old could understand. Amen. Look at Revelation 20 and 10. And the devil. Now what happens at the end of the 70th week of Daniel here, what happens here is Satan receives a thousand-year prison sentence. Right. right? That's why Ezekiel 38 says after many days, he, the, 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 the chief prince Gog, he says after many days thou shalt be visited. Isaiah 24 says that when the Lord comes back here, that he's going to gather the host of the high ones and the kings of the earth and throw it. They're going to be shut up in prison and after many days they're going to be visited. Right? And so Satan is shut up in prison here 
And at the end of the thousand years, he's loosed. And he goes and deceives the, the, the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them the battle. This is going to be the war to end all wars right here. Right. Churchill was off a couple thousand years, right? <laughs> the war to end all wars, right? Every one of them just liars, man, just right. liars. They couldn't tell the truth if they had to. Right here is the final battle. And it's after Satan is loose and he gathers an army uh, uh, from the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. And then, you know, they go up against the camp of the saints and God brings down fire and, and, and devours them. And the devil, verse 10, the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet, what? Are. You know how long they've been there? A thousand years. They're still there. And the devil's thrown in there with them and shall be tormented, what? Day and night. How long? Forever and ever. But forever and ever don't mean forever and ever. Here we go. You see, the problem is people don't like the implications. Right? Man thinks, man don't like these implications of eternal conscious torment for some creatures. Right? The beast, the false prophet, Satan, and then you come down there and everybody that's not found in the book of life is cast into this place. Right. Amen. And people don't like that. You're going to have to show me when they get out in Revelation 21, 22. You only got two chapters left. <laughs> now you show me when they get out. Now, now listen, guys, that verse is clear. Satan is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. And, and, and he's going to be tormented day and night forever and ever. Right. right? But you see, what we're having to deal with now is if Satan's going to be saved. <laughs> Universal salvation. I think the verse is clear. Yep. But for some people, it ain't clear enough. Right? And so we, what we're going to be talking about is did God create everything perfect? And the reason we're going to talk about that is because this is one of the foundational principles of this blasphemous doctrine of universal salvation. Amen. One of the foundational principles that they build this doctrine upon is they go back and say God didn't create everything perfect. That he created the evil. He created corruption to fulfill his will and therefore he's obligated. Somehow God is obligated. Right? That God is obligated to save everything. That God created his enemies. He created them corrupt. They're, I've talked to a man. I've talked to people on the phone that's told me this. Yeah. Right? And that because God created them corrupt, therefore he's obligated to save them all. Yeah. Right? You know why I call this doctrine blasphemous? Now universal reconciliation, completely different story, man. Right? But this doctrine here is blasphemous to the core. Right. Right. And the reason it's blasphemous to the core, number one, is it throws all unrighteousness of this world upon God. Right. And said God is the origin of it all. Right. The second reason it's blasphemous is it calls into question whether the Creator has a righteous right to judge anybody or not. Right. Mm. It's blasphemous. It is accusing the very throne of God of being unrighteous. If that ain't blasphemy, I don't know what is. You know what the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 3? Is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? After all that God has done, just because God found a way to be good in spite of your unrighteousness, it doesn't mean God is unrighteous for taking vengeance upon your unrighteousness. Right. If the truth of God is more abounded through my lie, Paul said, why am I yet judged as a sinner? Because you're a sinner. And just because God's truth found a way to abound more through your lie unto his glory doesn't rid you of the fact that you're a liar. Right? Right? The Apostle Paul said, is God unrighteous who taketh vengeance? That's what they think. They think God doesn't have a righteous right to judge the creature. That he's somehow obligated to save them all. You know what that means? 
If God don't, you know what they think about him? They think he's unrighteous. That's what they think. Guys, they're very close to saying, let us do evil that good may come. That's where they're very close to being at. And I know what Paul said about that crowd. Their damnation is just. Amen? Amen. Now, I would, I would ask you this. If God's unrighteous who take a vengeance, then how shall God judge the world? And we know that he's going to. The Bible's plumb full of warnings of the judgment of God. But I'll tell you this, man. If God, if that throne right there doesn't have righteousness when it judges then listen, man, there's nothing left. You realize how important the righteousness of God is. Amen. God has, listen, if God doesn't maintain his righteousness when all of creation has lost righteousness, if God doesn't maintain his righteousness, there's not a throne left in heaven and earth to condemn and get rid of sin. Right. The maintaining of his righteousness is important. Amen? Amen. There must be a throne to righteously condemn the world. Oh, yeah. Now I'm thankful that this righteous God also found a way to righteously justify sinners. Amen. But the same, listen, the same righteousness of God that justifies guilty men is the same righteousness that's going to condemn guilty men. God is not unrighteous in anything that he does. Amen. And so we got to to deal with these issues. You know what I've learned about people like this? And this is a big problem. I'm going to show you this. Right? In fact, come to Romans chapter 1. The people I've dealt with on this issue, and trust me, we are going to get to Satan. Honestly, we should be able to move on to a new subject at this point because I think Revelation 20 and 10 is very clear. But, but... What I've learned about these people is they never begin on a scriptural basis. People don't, people don't begin. Listen, if you're going to understand this book, and I've been at it 20-some years. I know Daniel, Marshall, and, and Ken, and all of you tell you the same thing. If you're going to deal with this book, you better start with the premise that you're ignorant don't know anything. Yeah, and start with the authority of that book. Because once you begin on a philosophical basis, you're heading down the way of pagans. And I mean that, man. Amen. You don't ever start on the premise that you know anything. Because what these people do, instead of starting on a scriptural basis, they start on a philosophical basis. Questioning and reasoning things in their own mind, and then they end up perverting the scriptures to fit their prejudiced ideologies. Yeah. And what I mean by prejudiced ideology, prejudice has nothing to do. Prejudice means you 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 do you you've already made your mind up prejudiciously. Paul tells us to prove all things, doesn't he? Yeah. Approve things that are excellent, things of that nature. And so and so. These people begin on a philosophical basis. They say, well, and and, and we're going to look at some of the questions they have. They start with a a faulty question and and bad reasoning, and then they end up perverting the truth of God to fit what they've already rationally thought in their own mind. Right? Look here in Romans chapter 1. This is how pagans have been corrupting the truth of God for millennia. Thousands and thousands of years is how pagans have gotten around the truth of God. Look at Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God. Neither were thankful, now watch here, but became vain in their what? Imaginations. There you go. Yep. Right? Right there. Right there in that mind. And their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be what? Wise, they became what? The quickest way to become a fool in this world is to profess wisdom. I promise you. Thinking you're smart. Thinking you've got the ability to go back and question the motives and the intentions of the creator. I think you've gotten a little too big for your britches at that point. 
Amen? Self-professed wisdom. This, 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 profess, this professing of wisdom is the quickest way to become a fool. So what does man do? He begins in his imagination, yep. right? This is how I see things. This is how I reason. This is how I understand. And then he professes wisdom. And you know what he ends up doing? You know what he does? He ends up corrupting the image of the uncorruptible God. All he's left with is a corruption of God. And then he'll change the truth of God into a lie. Now, if that don't terrify you, man, that's what, listen, this is not new. They've been doing this since Genesis chapter 11. Right? You've got 4,000 years of pagan history telling you this. You've got the Phoenicians You've got the Babylonians, the Sumerians, you've got the Hindus, you've got China, you've got the Celtics and the Gaelics of Europe. Look at their history. Look at how Israel corrupted God. Marshall, listen, you know the chief advantage Israel had over the nations is they had the very oracles of God. And Marshall quoted the verse today. They ran around the burden of the Lord, the burden of the Lord, and God said, you shall never say that again. He said, you're going to bear your own burden because you've perverted the words of the living God. You know what Israel did with the word of God? Perverted them. You know what man, now listen, God sent it to us among the nations. You know what man's done with it? They perverted the words of the living God. Look at verse 25. Romans 1, 25. What did they change? The truth of God into what? You know what the truth of God is? Jesus Christ said, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now let me ask you something. It don't scare you the least little bit when you've got thousands of universities spread around America professing wisdom and doing nothing more. They don't create ministers. You know, you, you listen, you know... Bible seminaries are not putting out Bible believers. They are making every year, they are making Bible critics and infidels. In this place where professed wisdom, they take this book right here that I hold in my hand and they change it to a lie. You know what the Bible says? God's wrath is revealed against that stuff. Amen? Yeah. Bunch of ungodly men. You know why they're ungodly? They think in their head that they're big enough to begin on an equal, equal line of sight with God. And say, all right, God, let's me and you have a conversation. Right? That's where these people are. They don't begin on the basis of Scripture. They begin here in their vain imaginations and in their self-professed wisdom. And then they'll corrupt and change God's word into anything they want it to be to fit their pagan ideologies. You don't have to be, listen man, you don't have to be running around half naked uh, uh, with with, uh, 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 a bow and arrow to be a pagan or a heathen. There are pagans and heathens sitting in Christian churches like this all over America every Sunday who are worshiping a God based on imagination and their own self-professed wisdom. And they stand up, corrupt God, and change His truth into a lie every Sunday in churches. Yep. Amen? Amen? You know what this approach is? This Beginning on this, this, this approach here is the clay thinking he has the wisdom and knowledge to question the work of the potter. Mm-hmm. Right? How would, y'all, how would y'all like it if y'all, if y'all built a birdhouse and that birdhouse looked up at you and said, what are you doing? <laughs> right? You realize that what is made by a maker can never have the wisdom to question the maker? Right. That's just common sense. Oh, yeah. Because you only have the wisdom that the creator put into you. Mm-hmm. And if you don't, listen, if you don't, there's, you're never going to have the wisdom to look back at your creator and question him about anything that he's doing. Amen. Because you're his work. That's right. 
That's, that's, just, that's just reality. That's just how it is. But what do they do? Well, if God knew that Satan was going to fall, why did he create him? How many of y'all have heard that question? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. I'll tell you what, man. People say, why did God, why did God do that? And I'm like, because he's God and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. Have you learned your place in life? You realize that there are things too wonderful for you to know? God never God, God said, listen, man, you're not going to know it all. There's things too wonderful for you to know. And so you might as well just get just go ahead and sit down and buckle up that there are things you cannot comprehend. There are things you're going to have to look at God and say, God, you are the creator. You are the only wise God, and I trust you in what you're doing. That's it. To God only wise be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Right? But, 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 you know, people, they say, oh, if God, if God knew that Satan was going to fall, isn't he unrighteous if he went ahead and created him anyway? Pagan. That's, that's, how pagan, that's how paganism begins. Another question they'll ask is if, if God created us knowing that we would all fall, isn't he somehow obligated to save all of us? Right? They're not beginning on a scriptural basis. They're beginning on corrupt wisdom. Right? If God knew that multitudes would end up in eternal conscience torment, isn't he unmerciful and unrighteous? If God knew that great multitudes were going to end up there forever and ever and ever, doesn't that bring into question his mercy and righteousness? That's where they begin. And so you know what their motive is? You know why they begin there? Their motive is to get rid of that right there. Because they don't like it. But I'll tell you this, is God unmerciful? You know what Romans eleven thirty two 32 said? He said he concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon who? All. Amen. God has taken pity and mercy upon all men. Right. Doesn't mean all men are going to be saved. Right. But this period you live in right here is God's long suffering showing mercy upon all men. Right. Now if you want his righteousness... Here's his righteousness. If you get justified by grace through faith and go up here to participate in God's eternal purpose through, his, through the body of his son, or if you end up here, God's righteous. That's right. That's right. He's righteous in his condemnation. Look at Romans 2. Look, over, look at Romans 2, 4. despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, there's man. Right. The reason they don't get saved is their hardened, impenitent heart. Yep. Right? Treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of thee. Read the next word. Righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his what? Deeds. You're going to get what you've earned out here. Yep. Now this right here is you getting what you didn't earn. Yep. Amen. Through the free gift of God's righteousness. It's his righteousness that provides for your justification. Right. But it's also his righteousness that's going to give you exactly what you've earned in the day of judgment. Right? What's, what's, how's God going to judge them? According to their what? Deeds. Mm -hmm. Right? Not just like the next crowd says, universal reconciliation. Right? Man is going to be judged out here based upon his deeds. You're told that in Revelation 20. Yep. They were judged out of the things written in that book, in those books, according to their works. Romans chapter 20. Or Revelation 20, I'm sorry. And so, and so there you have the righteous justification and the righteous condemnation of Almighty God. But here's the better question for everybody. Not, instead of sitting here and saying, well, if God knew this, don't presume that you know what God knew or what he was thinking back then. The better question is this. 
O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Who, do man, who, who, who does man think he is? Come, come to Job 38. Job chapter 38. You ever, you ever been sitting in a, this is, this is, how, this is, how, I, this is how I see this. O oh man, who art thou? I picture, I picture the throne of God there and I picture some man out there in the crowd, you know, questioning God. Why did you do this? And, and if you knew this, why did you do this? And I can imagine just a voice ripping down off that throne and saying, who is this? Who's this? Look, look here. Look at Job 38 2. I'm not making that up. Look at, this. Look at Job 38 2. Who is this? <laughs> right? Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Right? A man opening his mouth and speaking things without knowledge. Now let me tell you something. I believe Job was, any, was a lot wiser than the men questioning God on this stuff. How many of y'all have read Job? How many of y'all have read it more than once? How many of you still are fumbling around at the lips and <laughs> just having things going in one ear and out the other? Yep. There's some dark sayings in Job. Oh, Because yeah. I believe those, those, Job and his three friends, I believe, are wise men. But when God shows up, God tells you exactly what they are. Mm -hmm. They're men darkening counsel with words without knowledge. So that means all them words you read through Job, God tells you at the end of the day, it's words without knowledge. Yeah. And what he means by that is that not that these men weren't wise. There were things that they did not know. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that, that they only had part of the picture. Right? And that's what, that's what God confronts Job with here. Right? Job 38. And I don't know what time I started, brother. I think I've been going about 15 minutes. So. <laughs> Job 38, 2, he says, he says, who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? And what, what God's getting ready to do is he's getting ready to take Job to school. And the lesson of the day is, Job, we're going to learn how stupid you are today. Right. Now, now, see, modern Christians can't tolerate being talked to like that. They just can. It, it, it hurts them. It upsets them. I don't have to hear stuff like that. I tell you what, you spend enough time in that book and you'll be educated on how stupid you are. Right. Amen? Amen. Now, if you don't like that kind of language, we can use ignorant without understanding. But whatever, you, whatever word you want to use, whatever word makes you feel the best. <laughs> but the reality is God is going to take Job here and he's going to take him to school. Gird up your loins, Job. I'm going to give you a test. Amen. Get your big boy pants on. Gird them up like a man and let's go. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Good question. I know, I know we, were, we were in the mind of God back there. Right? So it's a lot deeper than you think. Because what he's wanting Job to understand is, is Job, where were you when I, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Because God's going to make a point to Job here. That we have an enemy. Job 41, Leviathan. We're going to talk about him some tomorrow when we talk about Satan. Right. And he, he asked Job, he says, can you draw Leviathan out with a hook? Mm. Do you know who brought Job up in Job chapter 1? It wasn't Satan. Who brought him up? Hast thou considered my servant Job? You know what he's doing? He's drawing Job's enemy out. And God's going to show here in Job 38 that he has rigged the heavens and he's rigged the earth for the day of warfare and for the great day of the Lord to take down his enemies. Yep. There's a lot going on in Job 38. Amen. He says, where were you, Job? What are, the, what are the foundations of the earth fastened to? Come on, everybody. we got some great minds in here. Because I don't know. Right? Look at, look at, look at verse 18. 
Hast thou perceived the breadth of the earth? Have y'all seen it? I mean, y'all been up in airplanes, you still ain't seen it. Right? Have you, have you, have you, look, look at verse 19, where is the way where light dwelleth? Okay, that's a great question. It ain't talking about that one. There was a light back there before the sun, the moon, and the stars. Have y'all read that? Yep. And God divided that light from the darkness. Mm -hmm. Right? You're living in the darkness right now. Proof is, is when that sun and moon and stars is put out, it's dark. Right? right? That light is up there. God clotheth it. He covereth himself with light as with a garment. Where's the way? As for darkness, where's the place thereof? Do y'all know the bound of darkness? Half of y'all been told that the universe is ever expanding. And yet God's telling you right here, the darkness is bound. It has a limit to it. Right. It's been bound by God. And there's a place where light dwells. Paul said God dwells in the light that no man can approach unto. Where's the way? See, we're just asking some questions here. God's asking you some questions, right? How high is heaven? Look, here, here's some good ones. Look at, let me read you some of these, man. I can't help it. I love these things. Look at, look at verse 30. The waters are hid as with a stone. What? Are you kidding me? What, the Atlantic? What waters? It, well, the, the context the context was, was going all the way back up. It's the context is the treasures of snow that God has reserved for the day of battle. Y'all ever read about them hailstones that fall in Revelation 16? Right. Have you entered into those treasures? He said the waters are hid as with a stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Canst thou bind the sweet influences of Pleiades? The sweet influences... What sweet influences? What about the bands of Orion? Do y'all have any idea where you're at right now? Because I don't. <laughs> That's God's point. Now you may understand some of them. I understand some of them. But even if I understand the question, I don't know the answer. Right. And sometimes the answer is no. Can you, can you loose the bands of Orion? No. That's the point God's making here. Do y'all know how high heaven is above the earth? Y'all want to give an estimate? I mean, he says it right here. He says in verse 33, Knowest thou the ordinances of heaven? Do you? Canst thou set the dominion thereof in the earth? Can you? How high is heaven above the earth? God said if you knew that, he'd cast Israel off forever. So you don't know it. But you know what else he said? As high as heaven is above the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. Yep. You know what that means? You can't perceive the height of heaven, neither can you perceive how much higher God's thoughts and ways are than yours. Amen. So what are you doing beginning on a premise of questioning the creator about anything? Yep. That's, where man, that's, what, that's, that's the problem with this philosophical point of view. Now, what, everything God just talked about in Job is things that you can see. You can see the earth. You can see the stars. You can see the constellations. Right. Do y'all realize how much labor is going on in your body right now? You have factories inside of you producing blood and white blood cells, and there's all this work going on in you just in the human eye. You can't perceive the labor that's going on in the earth. Amen. The earthworms aerating the ground and the seed and the grass and the, and the birds of the heavens and all this and that's all in the wisdom of God. And there was still wisdom he kept hidden himself. You can't perceive it all. In what you can see with the eye and the ear but we're talking about there's a wisdom out there that eye can't see and ear cannot hear. Right. Paul's saying, or, 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 or God is telling Job, he's saying, Job, if you're this ignorant about what you can see, 
Then think about what you cannot see. You don't know it all, Job. You're going to have to trust me. You have an enemy. And I'm going to destroy that enemy for you. Because that enemy mocks at you. When he beholds the weapons of man's warfare, Leviathan. You know how I know he's not talking about a crocodile marshal? Like all the Bible scholars say, is because he says, can you spear him in the head? Right. Well, I can a crocodile. Yeah. You know how I know he's not talking about some earthly animal? Because it says that the, on earth is not his equal made without fear. Genesis 9 2 says the fear of all beasts, that, that all animals fear man. Right, right. So there's something about this Leviathan. And it, he's a real enemy. And he's not scared of you. He's not terrified by you. But you know what God does with him? He plays with him like a bird in a cage. <laughs> when God's dealing with him, that, that Leviathan makes soft answers to him. Yeah. <coughs> And so, and so understanding this, you know, if you, if you can understand that you can't even comprehend what you can see with your eyes, how many of y'all have read that Bible quite a bit? Right? A little bit. <laughs> y'all read that book? Man, I've read that book. Y'all yeah, yeah. read that, read over there in Psalm 18, and I'm, I'm going to be winding down here in a second. But I, I read over there in Psalm 18, that Bible says that God bowed the heavens and come down. He bowed the heavens and came down. And darkness was under his feet. And he rode upon the cherub and did fly. Right? And darkness was the pavilion around him. Okay. Right? Y'all read it? Y'all read Isaiah 34 about them satyrs and unicorns over there? Y'all know what a satyr is? It's a half man, half goat. People say, you know, unicorns. Y'all know what a unicorn is, right? Unicorn really is not a horse. It's just anything with one horn, <laughs> right? Like the goat. Like the goat. <laughs> but it could also, it might be a half man, half goat with one horn. We don't know, right? I just know they're in the Bible, right? Yep. You know, don't be surprised if that white horse that rips out of heaven one day don't have a big old horn coming out of its head. <laughs> I'm not saying it does. What gets me is people say, oh, there's unicorns in the Bible. You believe in horses with one horn? Well, you believe in giant dinosaurs with three horns. <laughs> Triceratops. Right, right. At least I've seen a horse. <laughs> <laughs> the point I'm making is, is there's things in Isaiah 34 I don't understand. <laughs> I've read that book, man. Ezekiel. The trees that were in Eden going down to the nether parts of the yeah, earth. Y'all yeah. read that stuff? Oh, yeah. I don't know where I'm at half the time in Ezekiel. Right. And I've read it plenty. And I don't know where I'm at half the time in it. How many of y'all have read The King of the North, King of the South? Mm -hmm. Right? We ain't talking about Davies and Lincoln either, man. We're, <laughs> right? Listen, we're, how many of y'all have read about The King of the North and The King of the South? I can't figure that stuff out. I've been at it for 20 years, man, and I can't figure it all out. I've, I've, I'm, I'm smarter now than I was 20 years ago, but I still can't figure it all out. Right. Y'all read about the four chariots coming out from two mountains of brass and the two going to the north and two going to the south in Zechariah 6? I mean, if y'all know where you're at in the first six chapters of Zechariah, you're in a lot better state than I am. Because <laughs> Zechariah 6, just, I understand some of it. But I don't understand a lot. What about that elect lady and her children over there in 2 John? And her elect sister. You know, that stuff goes back to stuff in the Old Testament. Right? right? But here's, here's the point I'm making. I'm not God. If God were to contend with you, trust me, you couldn't answer him one of a thousand. That's right. If I wanted to, man, I, I see these. I see these people today, man. They get on. They get on Facebook. They, they, they. People learn half a Bible verse today, and they think it's up to them to go set the world on fire and become the saviors of humanity. And I, I'm here to tell you, man, that if 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 I wanted to, if I wanted to, I could get people so messed up 
They wouldn't know up from down with that book. Anybody that wants to pretend like they, but listen, imagine what God could do if he wanted to. You're not on equal par with God to be able to question him about anything. That's the point I'm making. You're the clay. He's the potter. Right? And we don't have any right to question him on anything. Right? And I'm going to find a place to close here. Look at Romans chapter 11. You say, I thought he was preaching on Satan. We're getting there. You got to understand you can't question the wisdom of the creator in making the, the, the anointed cherub. God had a reason for creating this being. Right? right? And you say, you say, well, did he know he was going to fall? Does God know all things? Yep. Yep. Did he know you were going to fall? It's a funny thing we don't ever question that part. Right? You don't have the right to question the wisdom of the Creator. Sure. You've got to start there. Yeah. Because if you don't, you and your corrupt mind is going to end up corrupting and challenging the very righteousness of the Creator. Right. You have to begin that God is wiser than you. Yeah. Look at Romans 11. Now we're going to get we're going to get into Satan's creation tomorrow. Well, actually, we're going to begin in Genesis three with the God introduces us to him before he gives us his backstory. I mean, he just shows up in Genesis three. You're just out of nowhere. The serpent, the serpent. What? What serpent? Who is this? Where did he come from? What's he doing there? Right. Right. God gives us the information. But, but look here in Romans eleven thirty three. 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Notice some things here. What, what about God's judgments? They're unsearchable. You got that? His judgments are unsearchable. What about his ways? They're past finding out. Meaning as far as you can go, they're beyond there. They're past finding out. Look, look, look at verse 34. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Right? No man has. Paul says, who hath known the mind of the Lord, but we have the mind of Christ. Now that's a different issue. Right? We do have the mind of Christ now. It's right here. Amen. But it wasn't, listen, it's the subject of revelation, not the subject of your imagination. Right, look, look, look at what he says next. Who hath been his counselor? When did you ever give God advice? Right, so what do we know, what do we know about this? The depths of God's wisdom and knowledge. His, his, his judgments are unsearchable. His ways are past finding out. No man has known his mind and nobody's been his counselor. Right? right? Who hath first given to him? And it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him, through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Yeah. Right? Paul says over in 1 Corinthians, I'm really, come, come one more place. 1 Corinthians 2, and I'll close here, I promise. 1 Corinthians 2. I think little Marshall went over a couple minutes. So I... <laughs> <laughs> Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I got to keep it fair, brother. It's... Amen. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul says, We speak wisdom among them that are perfect. Now, the wisdom of God is the depths of God's wisdom. When you understand Romans 11, what Paul has done in explaining to you the, the dispensational mystery of God and the future fulfillment of prophecy, this mystery and Israel being saved as it is written back there, what Paul has done has opened up to you the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge. He's opened them up to you now. He said, but if you're ignorant of this mystery, you're going to be wise in your own conceits. That's right. You're not going to understand the depths of God's wisdom. You're just going to be making it up. Wisdom that comes from your own conceptions and, 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 and conceits, mm -hmm. right? 
And Paul tells the Corinthians now, he says here in, in 1 Corinthians 2, 6, he said, we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. We're not talking about justification. We're not talking about you getting your sins forgiven. There is something Paul has that is much more. He tells the Corinthians, he said, when I came to you, I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. But now he says, how be it we speak wisdom where? Among them that are perfect. Those that are grown, matured. Right, Paul tells the Philippians, he says, as many as be perfect be thus minded. Right? right? The Corinthians weren't ready to receive Paul. What, what's Paul going to speak to them? What's he wanting to speak? Verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom ordained when? Before the world unto what? Our glory. Amen. There's four wisdoms in 1 Corinthians 2. The wisdom of man... The wisdom of the world, the princes of the world, and the wisdom of God. And you can tell which ones the Corinthians are participating in because there's the vision. And they're rich and full and reigning as kings. Whereas Paul, operating in the wisdom of the world, says, We hunger and thirst and have no certain dwelling place. We are buffeted. We are a spectacle. You know what he was? He was a a spectacle to the other three wisdoms. We are a spectacle unto angels and unto men and unto the world. Right? right. Right? Mm -hmm. But he tells these Corinthians, what about this wisdom of God? Well, it's been revealed by by God's Spirit. God has revealed this wisdom by His Spirit. It's known by those who have received the Spirit which is of God. Meaning, the revelation of God's Spirit received in your inner man gives you a spirit inwardly that is of God so that you can know the things that are freely given to you of God. You've been educated. Right? Look at what he says next. Which things also we speak. So God has revealed this wisdom by His Spirit. It's been received by those who have the Spirit which is of God. And then that wisdom is spoken by those who have been taught this wisdom. Not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. You know what that means? Those who've been taught the wisdom have a vocabulary that the world don't understand or use. Yeah. It's a glot. Oh, I ain't going to get into that. What, what, I, what I'm going to say is, is we speak in a language that the world don't comprehend. The natural man can't receive this wisdom because it's foolishness to him, and it can only be spiritually discerned. So the more you grow up, guess what? The more combative people are going to get towards you. So I just brush it off. Going to let the wisdom of the world falter me and get me bent out of shape. (laughs) Right? Look look at what he says next. He said, he that is spiritual. This wisdom can only be discerned spiritually. Right? Right? And it cannot, chapter 3, it cannot be spoken to the carnal. You cannot speak this. Listen, carnal people are saved. Sure. We're talking about babes in Christ. They're saved. You can't speak this wisdom unto them. They're not matured enough to receive it yet. That's why Paul said, I fed you with milk, not with strong meat. He didn't feed the Corinthians the same way he fed the Philippians. You got to get that. You say, you say, what's the point in all this? The point in all this is this. We have a wisdom to speak to the body of Christ Amen. that we've learned by searching the deep things of God. There's God's Spirit right there. And when you search the Spirit of God, you're searching the deep things of God. Amen. And as that Spirit educates you, you are receiving the spirit which is of God that you might know the things that have been freely given to you of God and you're being educated to speak those things in the words that the Holy Ghost has taught you. And the spiritual will receive it, the natural will not. But when you see people who are not ready to receive it, you have to feed them with milk. But we have wisdom. I can sit here and talk to you, man, about the very hope of God's calling up here. 
Right? I understand the, remember when Paul said, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge? You say, what is that? Remember the depths of God's wisdom and knowledge, Romans 11? Paul comes into Colossians 2 and he says, he says that you might come to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The mystery of God is what he's, Revelation 10, 7. The mystery of God is what God is doing through prophecy. The mystery of Christ is what was revealed to Paul. The mystery of the Father is all things being gathered together in one in the fullness of times. There's the treasures of God's wisdom and knowledge. Right. And for you to comprehend the, the part and the fellowship that you're playing into that eternal purpose. And we can sit here and educate on the doctrine God has given us to educate us unto this holy calling He's given us up there. Yeah. Not only for you to function as God's sons now, but also in the world that is to come. God wants to educate us as his children. Not the course of this world. We were educated in it. Paul says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's what he's talking about in 1 Corinthians 2. Searching the deep things of God and receiving the spirit which is of God. We can talk about this. We can talk about the things profitable unto all things. How to to prepare you and sanctify you for the master's use. Mm. Prepare you unto every good work. Paul Paul said in Titus that that Christ gave himself that he might purify unto himself a peculiar people. Zealous of good works. Ephesians 5, he gave himself for the church. Why? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he may present it to himself. What Christ don't get out with the water, he's going to get out with the fire at the judgment seat of Christ. You got two options. You can either let him wash it out with the book or you can let him burn it out at the judgment seat of Christ. He's getting rid of it one way or the other. Now, I, I'm, I'm clo- I really am closing. I mean... Remember, remember, I say this all the time. Remember Paul in Philippians, finally, my brethren. <laughs> finally, my brethren. He, had, he was only halfway at that point. That's chapter 3. Then he says it again in chapter 4. Right. Finally, my brethren. Really, finally, my brethren. Let me, let me say this. Is, is, is we have all this wisdom to speak. Right? right. We, had, we had a conference here last year on the judgment seat of Christ because it was being denied by, by so-called Bible believers. Right, and instead of, instead of it getting better, it got worse. <laughs> right? Right. So here we are. We're not, we're not having a conference where we get to talk about the renewing of the mind, proving the will of God, right? The measure of faith given to us to participate in the body of Christ. We're not getting to talk about pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ and winning Christ and attaining unto the resurrection of the dead, inheriting the kingdom of God, you know, bringing forth fruit unto holiness, right. how to walk after the Spirit, how to, how to be led of the Spirit, right? We don't get to talk about those things. Here we are in the year 2022 discussing over whether or not Satan's going to get saved. <laughs> right? I'm not, listen, I'm not saying, listen, I'm, what I'm telling you is we are biblically bankrupt in America. Yep. Biblically bankrupt. And you say, why are we big, biblically bankrupt? Because you're beginning the way pagans begin. That's right. You're starting on the premise of thinking you have the wisdom and the knowledge to be able to question the creator about anything. Right. You need to get on your face and keep silence before him. You say, that's Old Testament. It's still good advice for today. (laughs) Keep silence before him. Acknowledge your ignorance before God. And get in that book believing that it is the ultimate authority. And it can correct anything and everything that's going on in this world. Amen. And so tomorrow we'll get get into this discussion from Genesis chapter 3 on the serpent. That's where God begins, and we'll eventually get, hopefully we'll get into Ezekiel 28 and, and talk about the, uh, 
Uh, the, if you read Ezekiel 8, there's four verses there on Satan's creation, his creative state, and his position. And then there's four verses there on his, on his fall and, and, and resulting destruction. And so we'll try to get into some of that. But any questions on this? Probably, probably not. I mean, all we did was ask a bunch of questions. Nobody can answer anyways. But. All right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the precious blood of our Redeemer. We thank you, God, for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and what a privilege it is to be a member of his body. And God, to understand the hope of our calling to, to become the fullness of your Son in the heavenly places, to become the, the, the means and the mechanism by which he's going to execute his power and authority in the heavenly realm. God, help us to understand that we are just members of his body and teach us how to be subject to him and cooperating one with another all under, under the, 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 the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ the, to, to function in charity with each other, Lord, and to just function for the glory and purpose of the body of Christ. And God, I pray that you would just uh, be with us throughout the remainder of this weekend, Lord, be with the speakers. Uh, we just pray, God, that your, your son would be glorified and that your word would be magnified and that each and every one of the members of your body would be edified under that perfect man in Christ. And we just ask it all in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. 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 Amen.